step out of the rain into the Channel Awesome studio. I make my way into the lounge, where it's still raining. The forecast called for selective focus all week, and today was no exception. Everyone is getting ready to shoot our review of the Batman. Malcolm's prepared as Commissioner Gordon. Tamara's set to go as Catwoman. Hey, I'm Vengeance! I have Walter as Batman. Wonder how I'm gonna work that out. It doesn't matter, for there's a mystery to solve. Because like the Batman, this is a detective story. An important one. Trying to answer one of the biggest questions the film could have raised. Is that me as the gang leader? What the hell are you supposed to be? I don't know. looks like you. It looks exactly like me. The internet says it's you. Has the internet ever been wrong about anything? I'm gonna send this down to headquarters. No! This thing is so big it's probably already taken over the police. What should we do then? Keep an eye on it. I get the feeling there's more to this mystery than meets the eye. So yeah, this was surprisingly good. Matt Reeves' The Batman had a lot of hype when the trailers dropped, but before then there was a lot of doubters, mostly around the casting choice of Robert Pattinson as the lead role. Which meant, of course, in keeping with every controversial Batman choice, he turned out to be fantastic. But it wasn't just his performance that made the film work. I'll admit, my first concern was this was going to be too similar to the Nolan films. But thankfully, it had its own unique identity. The movie drew influence much more from the pulp detective stories that Batman had origins in. So it's like a mix of everything you think of when you visualize scuzzy film noir. It's rainy, smoky, has opening and closing narration, and more focus on the mystery rather than the crime fighting. This might be the first Batman movie to focus more on Batman than Bruce Wayne. In a good way this time. But that does bring up a good point. In the other films, this wouldn't have worked. But here? It thrives because it has the comic center of an awkward, crazy loner bringing justice to an awkward, crazy world. There's a lot of movie to talk about, more than at World's End's worth. So let's jump right into it. This is... making up for a lot. The movie opens, much like the rest of the film, kind of like a horror flick, with the Riddler watching outside the home of a politician. It utilizes visual storytelling from the start as we see him look at the ceiling window and the following shot at night shows it's cracked open. That was so subtle I actually missed it the first time. Speaking of missing stuff, uh, hello? Yeah, I'm watching it now. Riddle me this, can you see me? Uh, I knew I should have brought the other suit. He kills the politician and we cut to Batman, played by Twilight's holy shit these people can act to her doing something I'm shocked Batman's never done in a movie before. Narrate. Two years of night have turned me into a nocturnal animal. This perfectly sets up the detective and comic book element as both involve a lot of narration. Also, welcome back to Chicago, Gotham. You can pretend to be Times Square, but deep down we know you're the Magnificent Mile. When that light hits the sky, it's not just a call, it's a warning. This film apparently also got some flag for being too serious. But I argue strongly, there's a lot of comedy in it just for very weird twisted people. If you're not snickering at the Riddler's clear colored glasses with his serial killer mask, Gordon saying let the guy dress like a bat on the crime scene, or holding on this image while dramatic music plays, I don't know how to explain the humor to you. Just for a second, get out of the Marvel movie mindset and say, you know what? People dressing up like this is goddamn insane. And you'll get the movie's comedy. Speaking of visual storytelling, it might be a little obvious, but I love that this gang member who has his doubts about the crimes they're pulling off has only half his makeup on. 
And he's the one that Batman lets go. I like he saw he was walking that tightrope between good and bad, much like he does, and showed mercy. Or maybe he's Harvey Dent, I don't know. This is demonstrated in a scene where the gang members want to beat up a guy on the train. They're led by... Who are you? Are you me? Am I you? Perhaps I should check on what Commissioner Malcolm has discovered. Commissioner Malcolm! An envelope. Somebody thinks we're getting too close. Somebody who has the answer. I think this is more of a commercial break moment. Good point, I'll see you in 10 minutes. Oh. Anyway. At first I didn't like that they hear Batman's footsteps as his big thing was always stealth, but I quickly put together, he wants them to hear his footsteps. The hell are you supposed to be? I'm vengeance. So I'll admit, while I love the costumes in this movie, I hate the masks. Batman's armor is creative, and I will give credit that not having a bottom half of the mask really allows a lot more of the performance to come through. But he looks like Batman Skeeto to me. The stringy ears, the dollar store mask nose, it just doesn't do it for me. The Riddler's mask has the opposite problem. It covers up too much of his performance, a lot like Defoe in the Green Goblin. So much of what makes him creepy and funny at the same time is seeing his face. I feel like this could have been one of the great Batman villain performances if they actually let us see his performance. Get off! You deserve to be dead after what you did! You hear me? What the hell am I looking at? Catwoman. No, what? No, what? what were they thinking? All she has is a ski mask that's a little pointy at the top. She literally works in a job that requires her to wear sexy clothes, and she loves cats. There's no way they could have worked a sexy cat mask into this. This dude's dressed like somebody burnt the monarch. We can buy that somebody will wear a cat mask. It's not that far-fetched. You gonna let him in here? Let him through. I also love that Gordon, played by the often underrated Jeffrey Wright, is kind of a weirdo too. Batman's been around for only two years at this point, and people, understandably so, find his presence a little crazy. And Wright plays Gordon like a guy who's just given up and says, you know what? He gets results. The city is shit, and the guy who cleans the shit is gonna be a little weird. Just ask this dude a quiz job as a chanter. Batman gets a riddle addressed to him, so he takes it to his bat... subway. And eh, I guess I've seen enough caves. And we're introduced to emo Bruce Wayne. <laughs> No, I mean actually emo, like he even leaves the eye makeup on. Part of me kind of thinks maybe they should have left it on the other actors. Eh, maybe not. It won't be long before you've nothing left. I don't care about that. You don't care about your family's legacy? What I'm doing is my family's legacy. Some people are torn about this portrayal of Bruce Wayne, and I can't pretend I don't understand why. But I surprisingly like it because of Pattinson. We're still in his early years, so I think him being a shut-in gives him room to grow and learn more how to be a stronger Bruce Wayne as well as a stronger Batman. It's not like the world is rewarding him for being a shut-in. Every time he's Bruce Wayne, he sees ways he could be helping as a human being, but doesn't because it would get in the way of him helping as a giant bat. Your family has a history of philanthropy, but as far as I can tell, you're not doing anything. In the end, he realizes that, and instead of focusing on getting vengeance, he focuses on saving people as... Well, okay, still Batman. Yeah, I really would have liked it if Bruce wrote a check to the city or something like that at the end, but it doesn't look good on a poster. I also know the dude is 36, so he's not that young. But again, this is where the casting of Pattinson is very clever. I think it's safe to say we all still connect him to that emo kid from Twilight. And I think the film not shying away from that makes it easy to believe him as a boy Bruce Wayne, but also buy him as a Batman. The only thing I hate is how often he snaps at Alfred, played by Andy Serkis. You have to keep up appearances. He's still a Wayne. What about you? Your Wayne? Your father gave them to me. <laughs> I know that's like the idea, like a kid snapping at his father, and I'm glad he always has a humbling comeback, but this dude wakes up in a hospital after almost dying, and he's like, did you screw me over, old man? And he's like, suck my dick Grayson, you butthorse! The moment I knew Pattinson was a great Batman is when him and Gordon find another clue. With just the subtlest of reactions, he gives a look like, wait till you get a load of this. Some drive. How did he do that? It's almost the exact same expression he has throughout the entire movie, yet somehow I know exactly what he was thinking, and it got a huge laugh out of me. Who the hell says this movie has no humor? That's the penguin. That's the Iceberg Lounge. The clue leads them to an underground club led by the Penguin, played by Colin Farrell. No, I am. Yeah. 
Get out of here, Green Lantern. Hey, I got a riddle. What does a literal Batman sound like? Take it easy, sweetheart. As many have pointed out, it's hard to recognize Farrell under all that makeup, but for me, it's harder to recognize him under that performance. I got you! Take that, you friggin' psycho! I got you! I forget how much fun he had as Bullseye and Daredevil and that he can go really big and silly. So this strange hybrid of Robert De Niro in comedies and Al Pacino in dramas is pretty enjoyable. Holy God, what are you showing me? His head. Come on! Ah, you're gonna turn me into a meme over here! Selena Kyle, played by Zoe Kravitz, is pretty cool as Catwoman as well. She works at the Penguins Club and is concerned about the disappearance of her close friend Anika. The same way Vi would be concerned about her close old buddy, Caitlyn. Ani? Baby? Two points over Dark Knight Rises for the sole fact that she owns a cat! You got a lot of cats. You got a lot of shitty sequels. The two of them also had pretty good chemistry, as when he gives her contact camera lenses, one of my favorite gizmos in the movie, her advances never seem to penetrate his no-nonsense bat ways. You really don't care what happens to me in there tonight, do you? Look at me. Good. No time for love, Dr. Jones. She serves as a spy to see if they can figure out why the Riddler is knocking off cops and politicians. As she starts to get some answers, she's distracted by someone who might know where Anika is. Keep him talking. Wait, where are you going? No, stay on the DA. Bad kitty! Bad! Where's Annika? Thus, we're introduced to John Turturro playing Goddammit Nolan Lied to Me about how to say this name. You know Carmine Falcone. Falcone paid him off to get chill out in the open. Gif, Jif, no, nobody says Jif. Me, 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 no, nobody says me, me. Mako, Mako, I really blow at this. Selena is thrown off by him being there and she exits, leaving the DA she was talking to to be killed by the Riddler. Oh, you need a ride? That's me right there. So this might sound like a strange compliment and I don't think I've ever given it to a movie before. The focusing in this is amazing. As many people have said, the cinematography is next level, but I think the most impressive element is how well they utilize focus. Everything is shot like Batman, the Riddler, or really anybody can be in the shadows. Sometimes you're literally looking at nothing, but you think Batman might be there. Which, as he mentions, is the idea. They think I'm hiding in the shadows, but I am the shadows. And obviously it makes it much creepier when the Riddler strikes. This attack is perfectly built up like a horror film. And once the DA is knocked out, logically your next question is what the hell is he putting on him? If this was in focus, it would probably look silly and you wouldn't care what he'd be putting on him. Honestly, the blue and red lights don't really seem to have a purpose in the grand scheme of things. But out of focus, all you can say is Jesus, what is that thing? Well, that thing turns out to be a bomb as he's forced to crash into a funeral and give a message to the Batman. Again, if you don't find this funny, you're just not sick enough. Three riddles in two minutes. I'll give you the code for the lock. Batman does arrive, tries to answer his riddles, but when he's asked to hand over an informant, he panics and goes boom. He's fine. Yeah, I get fireproof armor, but fireproof skin? His face should look like a Rares of the Lost Ark candle. They take him to the Haas police station, where the evidence is clear. Any cop with a high-pitched voice is gonna be a dick. What's going on here? I got the press downstairs. He interfered in an active hostage situation. Blood is on his hand. SpongeBob here, Patrick. Get a hold of yourself, deputy. Gordon helps him escape in a flying scene that's shot amazingly, but I'm sorry. He looks like Rocky the Flying Squirrel in that suit. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! <laughs> I'm fine. Fine. Fine, 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 fine. Yeah, bet you didn't know this was a gritty reboot of The Tick. I smell a commercial coming. Oh, I better get to the thing. Commissioner Malcolm. Commissioner Malcolm. You got mail. Let's focus ourselves to that being open. If it's answers you wish to consume, I'll give them to you in the next room. It's a riddle. But what does it mean? I don't know, but we're not going anywhere until we crack this code. There are hundreds of rooms in the world. Thousands, maybe more. So how are we supposed to find this room? Let's try counting the letters in the riddle. Oh, they could be room numbers. Or letters of the alphabet spelling out a new message. One, two, three. 
three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. See Doug play Guardians of the Galaxy Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time on Twitch. We also got a new schedule and material six days a week. Hope to see you there. Batman catches the penguin dealing a drug called Drops when Catwoman interrupts his bust. And you know a movie's working when you feel legit bummed out when the person she's looking for is dead. Not gonna lie, this was really a downer. Oh no, my... cousin. This of course begins a big chase scene involving the Batmobile that I'll admit is pretty impressive considering it's a lot of the usual tight selectively focused shots. In the rain no less, yet I can still follow it all fine. <laughs> him some questions. You literally know where to find him. And as epic as that pissed off version of the Dragnet theme is, the one that says, son of a bitch, you're in trouble. This is the only part of the movie where I don't like Pattinson's acting. With all the amazing subtle looks he gives in this film, he need to give a your ass is ass look here. But for whatever reason, he gives a teacher, can you keep it down? I'm trying to sleep back here. Look. Where's that overcompensating bail face when you need it? They question the penguin and find out their journey leads to the abandoned orphanage. And yeah, I love with his feet tied, he legit walks like a penguin. <laughs> Should be amusing. <laughs> they go to the orphanage to find out who the Riddler's next target is. Jesus, his next victim is Bruce Wayne. Oh no, I'll be killed. I mean, Superman will be killed. Wait, what? The package is opened by Alfred, and I'll give credit, the film's dark enough, I legit didn't know if they were gonna kill him off or not. Sadly though, I have to confess, as suspenseful as this scene is, all I'm thinking is, OOH THE SHAKESPEARE HEAD FROM THE ADAM WEST SHOW! There's a C4 explosive set in the mailer. Alfred is blown up, but because explosions don't hurt anyone in the Wayne family circle, he survives. Bruce Bray paints a vision board in his back cave, or living room, to figure things out. Don't worry, Alfred will clean it up, alright. He gets a call from Catwoman who says she's gonna go after the people who killed Anika. She also reveals a big bombshell that Falcone is her father. He owes me that money. He owes child support? I'm the child? I think that makes sense! Now Thomas and Bruce Wayne, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that psycho's right to go after these creeps. What do you mean, Thomas and Bruce Wayne? What, do you live in a cave? Brum -bum -bum. The Riddler reveals that Bruce's mother was institutionalized, and to keep it a secret, his father made a deal with Falcone to kill the reporter who would leak it. He talks to Falcone to see if it's true, and come on, I think we can trust a crime lord to tell the truth. You thought your father was a boy scout, but you'd be surprised what even a good man like him is capable of in the right situation. Totoro in many respects is the scariest villain because he doesn't scream or shout like the other baddies. He only does it once in a while. For the most part, he's very quiet, very reserved. You could even see him as charming in different situations. Which you could argue demonstrates he's a much more powerful foe. As the saying goes, people with true power don't need to raise their voices. Even when he kills someone, he's still eerily quiet. <laughs> finds out from Alfred that his father did make a deal to keep it quiet, but didn't want anyone killed. They even introduced the idea that maybe Falcone is the one who killed his parents because he was gonna tell the cops. It was Falcone. We shall know for sure. I don't know if I like that idea of being introduced, but they do keep it vague that it could have just been a random criminal. Might be some random thug on the street you who needed money, you got scared and pulled the trigger too fast. Batman's origin ironically feels more meaningful the more meaningless the murder of his parents is. But hey, he might be Spider-Man based off this shot, as he discovers Falcone killed Anika and Catwoman is gonna get revenge by killing him off. Hey Dad, I'm Maria Kyle's kid. Oh my God, you're her father? Ah, jeez, did I father you too? He stops Selena from killing him and is finally brought to justice. <laughs> I'm finally seeing you in the light. You look ridiculous. He's shot by the Riddler outside the club and Batman rushes to his apartment to get him. Oh 
my god, Batman's the Riddler! Shut up, Frank. The Riddler is seen across the street, though, and again, I really feel like we've been missing a lot of Paul Dano's performance with his face covered up. Imagine this freaky-ass smile replaced by oven mitt face here. It just wouldn't be as creepy. He's allowed to shine in his unnerving, but like I said before, funny as hell splendor when Batman talks to him in prison. And if you're like me, your butthole clenched up as soon as he starts saying his name. Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne. Yeah, he's keeping it together, but in his mind, you know he's thinking. It turns out he's just talking about how easy Bruce Wayne had it as an orphan, where he was left in the orphanage forgotten. The billionaire with the lying dead daddy, because at least the money makes it go down easy. Yeah, it did, now that you mention it. Oh, God damn it! The Riddler assumed Batman was on his side, and as skin-crawling as he can be, again, if you see no humor to this performance, you gotta rethink a story about a guy dressing up like a bat. No! Oh! I like this guy. They are funny guys. So the third act is where things start to go downhill a bit. Nothing is ruined, but it gets a little sloppy and you do start to feel the length for the first time. We're almost two and a half hours in and I surprisingly before then didn't feel how long this was. But after this talk in the jail, they should have just gone straight to the climax. Instead, he goes back to the Riddler's place where we just were a moment ago to get more information. And the information is very obvious. Literally, the first question you probably have about the Riddler is what's that tool he's using to kill people? Only now, though, does Batman ask that and it reveals a clue. Second, he misinterprets seeing the real you as he knows his identity, but with all the double meanings and this politician's name everywhere throughout the movie, it's pretty clear he's gonna go after her. When the climax does get going, a bunch of bombs start drowning Gotham, forcing people into the stadium where his goons will kill everyone. And I don't know, maybe this is just a personal preference for me, but I think water is a very boring climax for a Batman movie. Aquaman? Sure. Batman? Feels kinda lame. But okay, even if you don't mind that, people still continue to make bad choices. The politician knows henchmen are out there to kill her, and it's probably at this location. But she says she literally wants to put a spotlight on her. The problem with this city, everyone's afraid to stand up and do the right thing. Gordon tries as little as possible to stop her. We're under attack, ma'am. Exactly. Excuse me. Ma'am. Stop. Don't. Not surprisingly, she gets shot. She didn't even have a plan. She was just going to guilt trip the attackers, I guess. Batman fights off the goons, but there's no big villains left to build up to. They're it. They're the last big battle. It'd be like ending Dark Knight with fighting off henchmen, but the Joker and Two-Face are nowhere to be seen. It'd be kind of anticlimactic. He injects himself with something to give him extra strength, but it's never explained what it is. Even the amazing focus is starting to look a little cheap. Clearly using CG in a lot of the shots. It looks so flat, it's like an eye exam saying, tell me when the Batman is in focus. But like I said, I can't say it ruins anything. I really like the henchmen using the same quote as Batman in the intro. I'm vengeance. Which makes him realize he has to make it more about the people and not himself. This leads to a great image of him leading everybody out, starting with the boy who lost his father in the opening. I like he thinks about what the Riddler said and chooses him first over the politician. I'll admit I feel like it should have ended with the closing narration and him looking at the boy he helped. Or, again, him helping out as Bruce Wayne to step Batman for once. I really feel like they were hammering that in a bit. But we get clearly two mid credit sequences that for some reason are played before the credits. One is foreshadowing the Joker. A friend. <laughs> I know they shot another scene with him too, and the actor's portrayal is fine, but it just doesn't feel like he belongs here, and not now anyway. He's a great villain, but we've met our quota. Let's give another one the spotlight for a bit. We also see Batman and Catwoman going their separate ways. It's fine, just god damn this would have been a much better ending shot. But screw it, I still think this movie's amazing. <laughs> I'm glad it has its own take while still staying true to what Batman is. All the acting is top notch, its cinematography is incredible, there's so much atmosphere. It really is like a detective comic brought to life. Any problems I have are all in the climax, and while it does hurt the film, it doesn't destroy it. 
I'm super excited to see where else they take this series, and hopefully where they don't take it. This version of the Cape Crusader, I love to see develop more and more. Just when I think I've seen enough of a character, there's very little left to explore, it's always great to see something breathe new energy back into it. Speaking of which, we still have a mystery to solve! Any clues? No, but she might have some. Ah. Cat Tamara, of course! Next room was code for this room! No, I just figured the riddles were pointless and I'd tell you what I'm up to. Villains would get their point across faster if they didn't use puzzles. I'm here to tell you that I have the answer you're looking for. We're not listening to anything until you take that mask off. Fine. Actually, you look better with the other one. The gang member from the beginning of the film? Yes? His name is... Elliot Warren. British actor, he won an Olivier Award. He's been working in film for about seven years. My God, this changes everything. Who would have thought? I'm Elliot Warren. Jesus Christ. It says he's playing a character named Douglas. Clearly I was trying to give a clue to myself. Are we really doing this? Look at him, he's the spitting image of me right down to how muscular we both are. Okay, I'm gonna take the weed you've been smoking and head up. It all makes sense. I'm Elliot Warren. Man, I can't believe he didn't use me in the review. Maybe I can get Rob to dress up as Alfred and come pick me up. <laughs> Critic? What the hell are you supposed to be? I'm Elliot Warren. Thumb. Drive. What's up everybody? Our cameos for charity are still doing great and so we're gonna switch it up this month. All through June we're donating our cameo money to Friends of Firefighters. Friends of Firefighters is a not-for-profit organization that provides independent, confidential, and free mental health counseling and wellness services to active and retired New York firefighters as well as their family members. So if you want a cameo from me as the nostalgia critic saying happy birthday or congrats or whatever you can think of, click the link below and be supporting a wonderful charity. And even if you're like, screw you, I don't want a cameo from you, well, spread the word about this charity anyway. Check out the site, donate, or share it on social media. Thanks so much again, and take care.